Okay, well, uh, welcome everybody. Let's go ahead and, and get the event started today. We'll have a, a brief introduction here at the beginning and then we'll, we'll, we'll get to the actual seminar. Um, let me begin by welcoming everybody to the SMU Physics Department Speaker Series yet again for fall 2020. Now, today's event is a seminar and we're gonna keep digging deeper into this month's theme of computing the cosmos. Uh, in a moment, Dr. Tim Hobbs, a postdoctoral researcher in our department and our host for the event today, will introduce our speaker, Vincent Chung. But before we get started, I wanted to uh, sort of make some reminders to our audience on Zoom. So Zoom is an imperfect system for having events like this. It's impossible to see everybody. All the cues, the physical cues are largely lost, even with cameras on. So in order to speak, if you want to ask a question during the event, you just have to type speak in the chat window and hit enter. And at the next opportunity, we'll interrupt Vincent and we'll uh, let him know that there's a question and then we'll have uh, some time for the Q&A during the talk. And of course, there's gonna be time for questions and answers at the end of the seminar as well. Uh, in general, you'll only be able to speak when called upon by a moderator. And that's just to keep the hot mic problem from occurring as we all experience in all these meetings. Now, I wanna let everybody know this event is being recorded and would normally be simulcast on YouTube but apparently the ability to simulcast to YouTube has been broken by Zoom and or SMU in the last two weeks. So we're gonna to have to give that up for today and uh, we won't be able to support anybody on the YouTube live stream today. All right, with those things in mind, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm gonna hand things over to Tim Hopp. So Tim, go for it. Thanks so much, Steve, yeah, for, for that introduction and set of reminders. So yeah, we're really delighted to have Vincent Chung joining us to give us an interesting seminar today. Um, yeah, so Vincent's an advanced graduate student in the nuclear physics group at the University of California, Davis, um, where he works with Ramona Vogt. So his work has primarily focused on explorations of quarkonium polarization, um, for instance, in the context of the color evaporation model and a number of other frameworks. So with his advisor, in collaboration with her, he's made a number of um, pioneering calculations, including the first polarization calculation using the particular model that he'll be describing for us today, the um, color evaporation or improved color evaporation model. At the moment, um, our understanding is that he's also looking into the next to leading order calculations in this context. So we're really excited to have Vincent, and I'll just uh, turn the floor over to him and thank him for joining us today for this exciting talk. All right, thank you, Tim, um, and for the introduction, and thank you, Steve, for the invitation. Um, it's my pleasure to be here giving a seminar. And so this is the title slide. So I'm gonna talk about quaternion production and polarization in the color evaporation model and I come from UC Davis um, Department of Physics and Astronomy. So this is my um, overview slide. Um, uh, I will mainly talk about quarkonium polarization. So I'll give a brief introduction of what quarkonium is and what are the, uh, the production models uh, we have so far. And my main study is on polarization. So I would also talk about what polarization is, um, how is it being defined and how is it being measured and I'll um, go over my work uh, in the color evaporation model and a more recently improved color evaporation model. So what is quirconium? Um, quirconium is a bound state of QQ bar. Um, and mainly in, ter uh, in terms of QQ bar, we only refer quirconium uh, as bound state of charm and bottom. So um, for uh, as a charm, anti-charm bound state, we would refer it as termonium. And for a bottom, anti-bottom bound state, it would be a uh, bottomonium. So they are being bound by the inner quark potential. Um, could, be, could be written in this form where the linear terms refer to the confinement and one of our terms refer to the Coulomb-like short distance behavior. So you can form bound states um, given this potential and you could have a spectrum of states. So on the left here is the bound state for uh, a CC bar bound state. Um, they are, it is the charmonium family and on the right is the BB bar bound state, um, the bottomonium family. So it, it gives a spectrum of states because um, we're having a bound state of two spin one half particles and they could also have orbital angular momentum. 
So uh, it, it would have a spectrum of spin states um, as notated in this spectroscopic notation. So all of them, um, all, all of the physical states are color singlets. They're um, colorly white objects. And there's, um, there's an important threshold per family. Uh, it is the HH bar threshold um, for charmonium. It will be the DD bar threshold. And for, uh, for charmonium, it's the DD bar threshold. And for bottomonium, it's the BB bar threshold. And what this threshold is important is that all the states below this threshold would decay electromagnetically into um, to a, a pair of uh, lepton and anti-lepton. So how are they being detected? Um, for S states, um, they decay to L plus L minus. So they could be um, observed as peaks in the dilepton mass spectrum. So this is a, uh, a dilepton, uh, a dimuon mass spectrum uh, measured at the CMS uh, at 7 TeV. Um, we can see all the peaks here. They're all, all of them are the vector mesons, um, including the lighter um, vector mesons. And here are the charmoniums and the bottomonium. And there's also a, a assumed plot for the, bot, uh, for the bottomonium where we can see the three S states uh, upsilons. The chi states could be reconstructed um, by matching an S state with a low momentum photon. So they are not being shown here because uh, they also need to be matched with a, a low momentum photon. And for the eta states, they decay hadronically, so we won't be able to see it uh, in, this, in this spectrum either. So quarkonium could be produced in a lot of collision system. Um, the one that I study most is the hadronic collision system, where um, it's two hadron um, colliding, each, uh, colliding with each other. Um, one example is proton on proton. You could also have proton on a, on a nucleus or even an, a nucleus on a nucleus. And these could be um, achieved in, uh, these collision system could be uh, achieved in, in RIC, Tevatron, and LHC. Uh, but there are also other um, collision system that can produce quarkonium. For example, you could have two gamma, and you can have um, uh, you can ha also have photoproduction and e plus e minus. Um, these are uh, examples of collision systems where quarkonium could be produced. So here's a brief timeline of um, how the theory and the measurement goes. Um, so in 1974, uh, the first Quarkonium, the charmonium, J psi, it was being discovered and followed by the discovery of Upsilon. And the color evaporation model, um, which, which averaged all the spins and colors, uh, um, was being developed ab about the same time. And followed by the color singlet model, which only considered the color singlet contribution, and followed by the um, non-relativistic NRQCD. So in a, in, a, in a brief summary of where we are standing is that we're not able to accurately describe every observable associated with quarkonium production using just one production model and one set of model parameters. So what are the observables that we're trying to describe? Um, they would include the use and distribution of the S state quarkonium, um, the eta states and the chi states, and more precise tests of model would include the production of one state relative to the other. For example, um, the ratio of, um, of 2s to 1s ratio for charmonium. And, and, and another uh, test of model could be the production of one spin state relative to the other um, within the same spin state. It's this, and that's the polarization. Um, for, uh, and, and for example, we could be talking about um, how much of J psi being produced in J z equals to plus or minus one versus being produced at J z equals to zero. And the status of as, as of right now is that the production models are still unsettled, um, even though J psi and upsilons are discovered um, in 1974 and 1977 respectively, um, and the production mechanism hasn't been solved yet. So there are different models being developed to describe the, um, the observables, and we can take a look at them uh, one by one. So the first production model was the color evaporation model. Um, and the, the production cross-section of the carconium is modeled, that's 
is modeled as, as shown here, um, where um, the craconium are treated just like a pair of Q and Q bar. So if we're, we're modeling for J psi production cross-section, it is essentially the same as producing a pair of C and C bar below the HH bar threshold. So we, uh, at the leading order, uh, this is to calculate the cross-section of producing a CC bar with the invariant mass from the production threshold to the hadron threshold. And there is a one factor, which is supposed to be universal um, for the craconium state uh, and it's independent of the projectile target and energy. So you can, uh, you can treat it as how much as a fraction of the CC bar pair being produced in this, in this window here uh, would, at, would at the end becomes a J psi, for example. And all diagrams for producing a QQ bar are being included independent of their color. And it has a, only just one um, fitting fit parameters per quaternion states. So for J psi, it would take a number. For uh, psi 2s, it would take another number. And this number, uh, this FQ, is being fixed by comparing the NLO calculation of the cross-section as a function of root s, or the rapidity at this, uh, or the rapidity distribution uh, at center rapidity. So, uh, so this factor could be obtained by matching with the data. The color singlet model um, uh, it's kind of trying to make more sense um, because the final state that we observe is a color singlet state. Um, so the color singlet model only constrains the production of, CC, uh, of the QQ bar to just the color singlet state only. And it assumes the produced QQ bar does not change its color and spin between the production and the hadronization. So, um, the color singlet model just focused on um, what is the uh, production cross-section for, a, a for a QQ bar produced in a single state and assume that would, um, that would eventually become uh, the craconium that we see. And the last model is the NRQCD. Um, it is an effective field theory where the production is described as an expansion of uh, as an expansion of alpha s and the heavy quark velocity. Um, this is the um, relative quark velocity. So hence the name uh, non-relativistic NRQCD. And, it, and at each order, the production is further factorized into a perturbative part uh, known as the short distance coefficients and a non-perturbative part known as the long distance matrix elements. So for example, if we're considering the production cross section for J psi, um, it would come from a sum of state, uh, color and spin state. And for each color and spin state, um, it is being factorized into the perturbatively calculable part and a non-perturbative part um, uh, in, in this expansion that's shown. So the, the color states are the single states and the octa states, and all, this, all the color and spin state are being considered in this NRQCD model. And the non-perturbative part, uh, the LDMEs, um, that describe the conversion of the CZ bars, um, color and spin state uh, into the final state J psi. So, uh, and this also assumes that the hadronization does not change its momentum. So the, these LDMEs or the mixing or, or of the LDMEs are conjectured to be universal and these parameters are being determined by fitting into the data. So there is a more recently um, developed in, uh, improved version of the color evaporation model. Um, the basic color evaporation model has no improvement made to it um, since the 90s. And the improved color evaporation model uh, made two changes to it. Uh, one of the changes is that the lower threshold of the, uh, of the mass of the CC bar pair is now changed from the, pr the production threshold, which, which was um, the mass to two times the mass of charm into the physical mass of the charm charmonium state. And the second change is that um, there's a distinction now made between the CC bar pair momentum and the momentum of the charmonium. So, um, these two changes allow 
this model, this improved, uh, this improved version of the model to describe the relative production um, for 2s to 1s, and also make um, also also make the PT distribution a bit softer and to explain the high PT data. So this model, this improved model, has been employed to calculate the production and polarization for all S states and the relative production of the chi states. So let's look at uh, some selected plots from each model. Um, so this is a um, result in color singlet model. It's rather uh, a new plot, um, but it also includes the old plot. Um, the, the, old, the old calculation uh, in gray uh, is the next to leading order calculation in the color singlet model. And uh, this was um, kind of famously known that it, it, it doesn't uh, describe the Tevatron data. Uh, it has a huge gap between the next to leading order calculation and the Tevatron data um, measured. So, um, and there, there are also, uh, th there's a recent improvement in this color singlet model, which shows that if we add the real emission contribution at the next to next leading order, um, and this is the red curve, uh, if we add that real emission contribution, then this color singlet model can describe the distribution. Uh, it can also it can describe that, that it can fill in the gap between the data and the NLO result uh, at Tevatron, and it can also uh, fill in the gap at other hadronic collision system. But it it, it should also be noted that um, the real admission is not the entire calculation. There is also a virtual admission um, that could change um, the result at the end. And in NRQCD, um, NRQCD is so far um, the most uh, employed to the, to the most kind of collision system. So it has been, it has been applied to hadronic collisions, um, two gammas, photo production, and E plus E minus. And there's a global fit by, um, by Budtenchen and Neil that consider their mixing of the LDMEs and fit it to the global data uh, which is available. Um, so they are, they're able to use um, the same set of LDMEs to describe as much data as possible. And they have a great success in describing the data in hydro production, uh, in photo production in E plus E minus, um, except, for, uh, uh, except for this plot right here, um, on, on the right right here uh, in, in the two gamma, the new plot, the, the, the new fit that they, they, they did uh, has a worse um, comparison to data compared to the old fit, which only considered the mixing of the LDMEs to a single uh, measurement. So overall they have uh, a, a good success in, des in describing the global uh, data uh, using the same, same mixing of their LDMEs. And they have a very low PT cut as well. So the, uh, the lowest they could go is, is 1 GeV. And for hadronic collision, um, they, they go as, as low as 3 GeV. So this is what um, NRQCD uh, looks like if we were to take at, um, if we were to take it a component wise. So um, on the left is the decomposition of just uh, next to leading order and le leading order comparing the color singlet and the color octet contribution. If we look at the cyan curve here, um, the, just looking at the color singlet contribution, even at next to leading order, uh, it would underestimate the data. And once they add in the color octet contribution, then it, the NRQCD um, can describe the data really well. And so on the right shown is the component wise, um, how they look like um, in, in this global fit, how each component contribute to the total yield that they, um, that they predict. So this is one of the selected plots for uh, relative production in NRQCD um, where the, the ratio is the 2s to 1s ratio for the Charmonium family. Um, and what they calculated is, uh, what this group calculated uh, results shows that uh, it agrees with the data at most PT. And 
the relative production of chi C and chi B are also dominated by the color singlet model contribution. So um, this is what um, they have calculated. Um, but there are also other groups that use NRQCD and they have a different method. Um, each group varies slightly, um, but they, in general, the relative, the relative production is well described in NRQCD also. Um, but there's one um, problem uh, in NRQCD is that uh, for A to C um, production, um, so far all of the, all of the NRQCD result would uh, overestimate the LHCB A to C yields. So uh, each column is refers to um, different groups and each row is, uh, is the LHCB, LHCB A to C yields at 7 TeV and the second row is at 8 TeV. So the, the first column is the global fit result. Um, uh, the, the yellow is the total, which is the color singlet plus the color octet um, contribution. Uh, and they're, they're the closest um, to the experiment, uh, to the experimental data, but they're still overestimating it. Um, and so far, uh, all of the groups are showing that, um, that the result could be described by the color singlet model uh, alone. So um, if, if they are using this, the same mixing to describe shape psi, then using heavy quark spin symmetry, you can also translate that result into A to C yields. Um, but so, um, but apparently this um, this translation um, does not describe the A to C uh, result. There are also there are other NRQCD calculation which can describe the A to C result. But again, if if they were to use the same mixing of the LDMEs to describe the JPSI, psi, um, they would not describe the JPSI psi polarization. And that's uh, what we're going into. So um, on the other hand, uh, in the color evaporation model, uh, it has one fitting factor for each quirconium state. So for a quirconium state JPSI, psi, there would be an FJ psi. For uh, psi 2s, there would be a psi, uh, F2s. Uh, it has great consistency with experimental result over a large range of root s. So on the left, it's the JPSI cross section um, all the way from 40 GeV to um, to the TV scale. Um, and using just one fitting factor, um, it has a great consistency and it, it can describe the experimental data uh, really well. And on the right, uh, it's, a very, uh, it's a similar plot for um, the sum of the bottom ammonium states. Um, again, three, uh, three fitting factor um, can describe the um, cross section as a function of root s. And it can also describe uh, rapidity distribution and PT distribution uh, very well. And overall, it is a less rigorous model. It consider uh, it is averaging over all color state and only just using one fitting parameter for each state. Um, but it gives accurate predictions. Um, and there, there were no advance in this basic model since the 90s. And, and, and then in 2016, uh, the, uh, Yan Ching Ma and Ramona Vo, um, they improved this model and made two changes. Again, it's one is the, in the lower threshold of the mass of the CC bar and the momentum of the CC bar versus the momentum of the termonium. So making these two changes allow this model to now describe um, the ratio of the, the ratio of the cross section, the two S to one S ratio, and also makes uh, it describe the PT distribution um, better. So here is the PT distribution uh, in this model at, uh, on, on the left, uh, on, on the left column is at 200 GeV, on the right column, it's at 7 TeV. In the top row, it is the J, um, it is a J psi result, and in the bottom row is the psi prime result. And if you take the ratio of the two, then you can get um, the cross, uh, the relative reduction um, in that model. So uh, at 200 GeV and a seven uh, and a seven TeV this ratio is being described um, with the two changes um, made to the model. Without these two changes, um, 
without these two changes, this ratio is uh, it's very close to flat in a traditional color evaporation model. And part of my work is to calculate, uh, use this model to calculate um, uh, the, chi, the chi C and chi B production. Uh, I had some success in chi C ratio, uh, but not that much in chi B. Um, the ratio will become flat at high enough PT, um, but the bottom ammonium mass is a, a bit larger. So um, in terms of scaling, it doesn't become flat until you hit 20 GeV. Um, but for termonium, um, it's relatively smaller mass, so um, it becomes flat at a, at a lower PT value. So these, um, these are for KT factorized result. They are not um, directly uh, comparable. Uh, should be noted that. So in summary of the model of the development, um, we started with a simple model by just averaging over color, uh, color and spin states. Uh, and, and historically, um, both color and spin are being uh, averaged in the color evaporation model. And we, start the, uh, and we started to make more sense um, by limiting our, con our, our con consideration to just color singlet production, and hence the name color singlet model. Um, because it, it couldn't describe the data, um, there, which suggested that there should be more being added um, to describe the, the experimental data. So we bring in the contribution from color octa states through the non-perturbative parameters, uh, and that's NRQCD. Um, there is some recent um, improvement made on the color evaporation model, um, and, but there are also uh, other, in, other uh, work in improving other model as well. So that's historically where, uh, where we come from. So color evaporation model and NRQCD uh, remain the most commonly used model today, and they can predict yields and relative production of different carconium states. Um, but we need more precise tests of models, um, or we need other tests of model because um, they can already predict the yields and relative and relative production. Uh, so, uh, so we, we would be asking question: What about the relative production of um, different spin projection state of the same perconium states? And that would be polarization. Um, so, just a quick comparison between the color evaporation uh, model family and the NRQCD. Um, the color evaporation model is less rigorous. Uh, it has fewer fit parameters. Uh, and so far, it has only been applied to uh, extensively to hydro production. Uh, and on the other hand, NRQCD is more rigorous, it's split into color and, spin, uh, color and spin state. It has, and hence, it has more fit parameters. And it has been applied to all collision system, yeah, as we have seen in the global fit. So what is um, polarization uh, in precise? Um, in general, polarization is just being defined as the tendency of the croconium to be in a, uh, in a certain angular momentum state given its total angular momentum. So for example, if we have an unpolarized in J equals to one production, it means um, J is equals to negative one, zero and plus one are being produced equally likely. So we get one third um, for, for each. So, uh, and this could be observed in um, when, when we make an angular spectrum as a function of theta. Um, if you have a purely longitudinal uh, production, then it will be uh, in this uh, dotted curve, it would have a peak at half pi. If we have a purely transverse production, then we'd ha we would have uh, this dashed line here and has peaks at zero and pi. Um, and if we have an unpolarized production, then it would look like a flat line. So how is that theta being defined? Um, there are three commonly used choice for, um, for, for, this, uh, for, for the z-axis. And regardless of the z-axis, the theta is being defined as the angle of the positively charged lepton. Um, uh, and the, the, angle is, the angle theta is always being defined as the angle it makes for the positively charged lepton to the z-axis. So how is the z-axis being defined? Um, there are three commonly used choice. Um, the first one is the helicity axis. Um, it is the quarkonium 
traveling direction when boosted back into the Croconium rest spring. Um, the second choice is the Colin Sopper. Uh, um, sorry, the second, the second commonly choice is, uh, the second choice is the Godfrey Jackson frame, uh, where the z-axis is pointing exactly as one of the beam direction. And the secondly commonly used choice is the Colin Sopper frame, uh, although it, I introduced them in the, in the, in the third order. Um, it is the angle bisector of the Godfrey Jackson Z axis and the, uh, and the direction of the other beam. So uh, it bisects um, this angle right here. So helicity frame and Collins Hopper frame, these are the two most commonly used um, frames to measure polarization. And regardless of the Z axis choice, the theta angle is always defined the same way. Uh, it's the angle between the Z axis um, of the choice and a direction of travel uh, for, for the uh, positively charged lepton in the Kirkonian rest frame. So um, the angular uh, distribution could be um, expanded in, 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 in this way. And um, the, the most commonly referred as polar, um, all, 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 the, all, all the pre factor here, all, all the, the lambda theta, lambda phi, lambda theta phi, they're all referred as polarization parameters. But the, the one that makes the most um, uh, intuitive sense is the lambda theta, because lambda theta describes how much is being produced in a JZ equals to zero, and how much it is being pr produced in JZ equals to plus or minus one. But they're all being referred as polarization parameters. Um, and they could be obtained by making angular spectrum. Uh, and for example, if you want to extract lambda theta, um, you can make an angular distribution as a function of cosine theta. Um, and you can measure the curvature uh, and obtain the lambda theta that way. And other angular, uh, other polarization parameter could be um, measured in, in, in the same, uh, in, in the similar fashion. So why do we need a model? Um, for a si single elementary process, um, the polarized to total cross section um, uh, could be could, could be written in terms of um, the amplitudes a j z s. So for a for a single elementary process, you can um, it comes from a zero squared, a plus one squared, and a minus one squared, and you can combine them um, to predict to to give the polarization parameters. Um, these are lambda theta, lambda phi, and, lam uh, and lambda theta phi. Um, however, for just a single elementary process, uh, there's no combination that would give all of them to be the same and be zero. Um, so an unpolarized production can only uh, be described by a mixture of sub-processes or you have to do some randomization modeling. So this is a, one of the, uh, it's a great plot showing that you could have lambda theta to be zero, lambda phi to be zero, uh, but then you, can, you would miss lambda theta phi to be zero. So uh, if you're just considering just one single elementary process, then um, you won't, you will never have um, them being, all of them being zero. So it has to come from a mixture of sub-processes and, and hence we need a model. So it's important to uh, understand polarization, uh, not just from the theory standpoint that they are strong tests of production models, um, but the detector acceptance also depends on the polarization hypothesis. Uh, and understanding the polarization um, uh, would help us to, under, uh, to narrow down the systematic uncertainties. So uh, here in the below three plots is the acceptance at, um, at ATLAS, where if you assume the polarization to be all zero uh, as flat, then um, the acceptance as a function of PT and rapidity would have a different um, would have a different look compared to uh, if you assume the polarization to be completely transverse, and it will again be different uh, if you assume the polarization to be completely longitudinal. And these um, acceptance variations would eventually be reported as systematic uncertainties. And this is a plot um, from, L from, from LHC B, uh, B that um, if they assume the production is fully transverse, um, 
it would be the red data points. And if they assume the polarization to be fully longitudinal, then um, they would have the blue data points. So understanding polarization is not, uh, it, it's good for theory and experimental interest. So, um, so what is the polarization puzzle that we're uh, trying to solve? Um, this is a uh, kind of all-in-one plot of, to show that NRQCD um, cannot describe the polarization and the, and, and, and the production simultaneously using the same PT cut and the same mixing of their LDMEs. So for each role here is a calculation um, being done in NRQCD using different PT cuts and each uh, column refers to an experimental observable. So in, in, and they are E plus E minus cross-section, uh, EP uh, cross-section, and a hadronic uh, PT distribution, and the JPSI polarization in hadronic collisions. So um, the first group, which was the global fit group, uses the smallest PT, uh, uses the smallest PT cut, uh, includes all uh, a lot of data, not just these three sets of data into the, into the fit, and they can describe um, the data really well as seen before, um, but using the same LDMEs, using the same mixing of the LDMEs, um, they would not have agreement with the polarization data. And the second group, which uses a larger PT cut when fitting their LDMEs and only takes the uh, hydro production into their fit, they will describe the polar, um, they would have a better description of the polarization, um, but using the same mixing of the LDMEs, they would uh, over predict um, the data at other places. And this, the third group here uh, uses an, uh, a larger PT cut, um, which also have taken the polarization data into the fit. Um, they would have a good agreement with the data, um, but if this, but if the same if, if, if the same mixing of the LDMEs are being applied to describe other observables, then they would um, over predict predict even more. So um, this is known as a polarization puzzle in an RQCD, uh, where you can't just use one set of LDMEs, use a small PT cut, and to describe all of the data and its polarization. So um, this is a problem that we're facing right now. Um, and not to leave this out is that there are approach within the, the framework of NRQCD as uh, the color condensate um, to when, when being applied on top of NRQCD, uh, this could be a solution to, to solve the polarization puzzle. Um, and what they did is uh, where the gluon distribution is calculated using CGC and uh, and, and the QQ bar conversion to the final state JPSI is being described by NRQCD formulation. So, so this is one of the proposed solution to solve the puzzle, and they have a good uh, agreement to data uh, for uh, PT less than 15 GeV. Okay, so back to NRQCD, just NRQCD alone. Um, Upsilon polarization for 1S, 2S, 3S doesn't seem to be a big problem. Uh, in, NR, in NRQCD, probably due to um, the upsilon mass. Um, so what, um, it, it's essentially the same group. Um, if they have included the feed down production from the chi B states, then the polarization for 1S, 2N, and 3S state uh, will be a lot more closer to the data measured by the CMS. So um, upsilon polarization due to its mass uh, it's less of a problem in an RQCD. So mostly polarization problem, uh, it's referring to uh, JPSI polarization. So what my work is, um, is that, well, color evaporation model, it's the oldest model, um, but no one has used that to predict polarized ca um, calculation. Um, so um, it's worth vi uh, revisiting back to this model uh, to calculate polarized results. Uh, and uh, my advisor and I made a few calculations um, using the color evaporation model, and then we also moved on to the, color, uh, to the improved color evaporation model. 
So what we started with is we started with um, unpolarized color evaporation model at the leading order. And we first, um, as a proof of concept, we separate the different SZ states from the total production. Um, and after that, we try to extract the orbital angular momentum so we can actually match our um, CC bar to the real charmonium state. And after that, um, we tried to explore the PD dependence uh, using KT factorization. And what we're doing right now is that we're trying to go to the next order in alpha uh, in alpha s to describe the PD dependence um, of, of shape side polarization in our model. So I'll first describe how, uh, how our calculation goes um, uh, at, at, um, at alpha s squared. So at the leading order um, to produce a QQ bar, um, then the QQ bar would not have any PT. Uh, it would only travel along the beam line. So, um, but there's, 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 so there's no difference in the, in the three commonly used axes. So we first started by projecting the spin of the heavy quark onto the beam axis. So the diagrams being used at this order is, um, is there's one diagram uh, for, QQ, for light QQ bar to heavy QQ bar and three diagrams for uh, gluon fusion to uh, QQ bar. So the polarized amplitudes are obtained by first separating these amplitudes according to the SZ of the final state. And, and then before we square the amplitudes, we extract the orbital angular momentum uh, in, by looking at their dependence uh, on cosine theta. And, and then we square the amplitudes, and so we get the polarized amplitudes. Um, there are some, um, once we have the polarized amplitude calculated, then um, we form the amplitudes for, um, for the definite J uh, values, 0, 1, 2, to match the physical states for J psi, chi, um, chi C1 P, and chi, C, uh, and chi C1, and chi C2. So the formula that we um, uh, that we calculate the hadronic cro cross section is uh, is the uh, traditional color eva evaporation model uh, for our first calculation, and then and then we also move from color evaporation model to the improved color evaporation model. So uh, we convoluted our um, partonic cross section with the CTEX six uh, with the CTEX six. Um, Parton distribution function and the alpha s is calculated at one loop level. And we took the factorization and renormalization scale to be the same. And we vary the mass of the charm quark and the bottom uh, and the bottom quark to obtain our uncertainty band. Uh, and in this model, uh, we assume the polarization is unchanged by the transition from the parton level to the hadron level. So the traditional color evaporation model assume the linear momentum is unchanged in the hadronization transition. So what we did is we go a little bit further in assuming that the angular momentum is also unchanged in the same transition. So if, after we can calculate the polarized cross-section for, um, for, uh, uh, for each spin state, um, J psi, J psi 2s, chi C1 and chi C2 for the charmonium. We combine the, polar, uh, we combine the polarization um, by modeling a feed down process. Um, so basically what we did is we model the prompt production of J psi, uh, assuming that 62% of the direct J psi, um, uh, assuming 62% comes from direct, directly produced J psi. And we do some spin algebra and and figuring out um, how, uh, how would that influence the depolarization of the promptly produced states. And for the S states, it's, uh, it's one to one conversion, um, but for the P state, it's, uh, it's, a, it's slightly different. So when we are pre uh, presenting the polarization, uh, it's usually presented as, uh, in, in terms of polarization parameters as seen before. Um, so, um, and that, um, 
So one of the polarization parameters that describe how much the production is favoring Jay-Z equals to zero versus, J versus how much the production is favoring Jay-Z equals to plus or minus one is the lambda theta parameters. So if we take a look at this formula right here, if we only have a purely longitudinal polarization, uh, uh, if we have a purely longitudinal production, um, and that is only Jay-Z equals to zero is being produced, then we would have uh, lambda theta equals to negative one. And if we have a purely transverse production, then lambda theta would be plus one. So this is a polarization parameter. It's a number that goes from negative one to one, and that would describe um, which, uh, which components being, is favored more. And for the P states, you can do it uh, in, in a similar fashion, um, but, but you also have to keep in mind that um, the, a, a JC equals to plus one for chi C1 is not gonna be the same as um, the J psi JC equals to plus one. So these are um, the factors here, the coefficients here are carefully crafted or chosen so that um, they would describe the polarization of the final state J psi, assuming the feed down only comes from, uh, assuming the production purely comes from the feed down. So in our calculation, we only have um, uh, J is equal to plus one and uh, minus one and zero. And um, so we don't have J is equal to plus or minus two. And using symmetry, they have to be, um, the J is equal to plus one and J is equal to negative one amplitudes have to be the same. So the polarization parameters can just be described as the ratio of the Jc equal to zero to the total production. So this one uh, selector plot uh, using collinear factorization approach. Um, and this is for promptly produced upsilon 1s uh, in proton on copper and with the root snn at 38.8 GeV. So we found that um, the longitude and uh, the polarization of promptly produced upsilon 1s is longitudinally polarized at small XF and it's transversely polarized at large XF values. And it's, and it's, and, and this prediction is consistent with the uh, near, near zero polarization for epsilon one s um, reported uh, by the new Z collaboration. So after we did our um, calculation at, at collinear factor, using collinear factorization approach, uh, we started to explore the PD dependence, um, but without getting into the next order. So, um, uh, so, so we, uh, we, we thought the KT factorization approach would be uh, a quick way to figure it out. Uh, how would it look like if we were to put in PD dependence? So uh, in the KT factorization approach, um, uh, we used the following, um, we, we made some changes to the calculation so that um, it fits into the KT factorization approach. Um, so for, for this calculation, we only use the gluon fusion um, diagrams in, in, our, in, our, in our calculations. So the, the amplitudes are being calculated uh, in a similar fashion. We first sort it by the, uh, according to the SZ of the final state, and then we determine the, angular, the orbital angular momentum by extracting um, the, the component and, um, and then we convolute it with the uh, PT, uh, with, with, with the transverse momentum dependent uh, part-time uh, distribution functions. So this is uh, what the cross-section looks like in the KT factorized ICM. Um, so we consider um, two off-shell gluon going into the final state QQ bar and these offshore gluons are uh, being produced, uh, are, are, are governed by these um, KT dependent PDFs. And the PDFs that we use is the uh, Jung and Hauptmann uh, PDFs in 2013, uh, 2013 uh, PDF set. The factorization scale is set as the transverse mass of the produced CC bar. And we also vary the mass and, um, and the renormalization scale uh, to obtain our uncertainty band. So this is uh, what the result looks like. Um, on the left is the JPSI PT distribution. On the right is the Psi2S PT distribution. So we did try to vary the mass of the charm 
um, the factorization scale and the renormalization scale. Um, and by fitting to the data, we obtained the factor for uh, JPSI product production. So we also assume since what we have calculated is a direct, uh, is a direct, uh, is a directly produced JPSI, and we're comparing it with inclusive JPSI. So we assume a constant ratio uh, of the direct to inclusive production, uh, and we also compare our result um, for psi 2s, assuming that um, the direct, the direct production of psi 2s is the same as the prompt production of psi 2s. So we found that this model is able to describe the yield, um, the, the PD distribution and the rapidity distribution, um, but it has a strong dependence at high, P, uh, has a strong dependence on the factorization scale at high PT. Um, this comes from the fact that the PT of the final state quaternion purely comes from the, the KTs, the sum of the KTs from the from the offshell gluon, so it has a, it, it, so it it would have a strong dependence on the factorization scale, and this would grow um, as a function of PT as well. In terms of the uh, describing chi c uh, chi c one and chi c two, we also try to do that and compare it with the atlas data. So uh, we find find that, and, and by taking the ratio, we can also take. Uh, we can also compare uh, our calculation to the um, ratio measured at Atlas. So we found um, a good consistent uh, a, good, a good consistency with the data by considering our uh, our calculation for uh, the chi states. So now we have all of the FQs fitted. We have FQ for JPSI. Psi 2s and chi c1 and chi c2, uh, chi c2. then we can uh, form or promptly produce jake psi, um, assuming the same feed down production as co considered before. Um, so, and we have a good uh, agreement with uh, previous color evaporation model result and the and the data as well. So, the new one. Uh, it's in blue. The, uh, it, the, in blue is the improved color evaporation model using a KD factorization. Uh, and in, uh, in magenta is the traditional color evaporation model in collinear factorization. And in green is the improved color evaporation model in, in the collinearly factorized approach. So all three of them are agreeing each other. And when the feed down from uh, from beam on is also added using funnel. Uh, we also found that a good agreement with the inclusive JPSI um, uh, production measured at uh, uh, at least over a large range of beam energy. So it can describe the um, inclusive JPSI um, all the way from 5 TeV to 13 TeV. And our main goal is to get polarization. So the polarization in this calculation, uh, in the Collins upper frame, uh, it is uh, slightly negative, slightly towards longitudinal at low PT, and it becomes um, nearly unpolarized at moderate P PT, and at large PT, it becomes slightly longitudinal again. Uh, in the helicity frame, it's the kind of the opposite uh, behavior. At low PT, it is slightly transfers and at moderate it becomes um, nearly unpolarized and at really large PT it becomes slightly transfers. So um, the agreement with data it's kind of frame dependent. It depends on uh, it depends on which frame that you're trying to compare with data. So uh, a, uh, a, a similar story for Upsilon production when we switch or charm mass into bottom mass, um, then we can consider upsilon production. Um, this is the PT distribution at uh, 7 TeV, and when compared to CMS data, um, it also has a strong dependence on the factorization scale at large PT. And when we when we set the factorization scale at just uh, MT, then both 
uh, both the PT distribution and the rapidity distribution are, are being described. So and right here is the Upsilon 123S rapidity dis distribution at 7 TeV um, and compared to data. So the polarization in bottomonium, uh, it's similar uh, in, in a Collins, when, when, when calculated in the Collins software frame, it is slightly uh, longitudinal and it becomes um, unpolarized at larger PT. And in, when calculated in the helicity frame, it is slightly transverse um, at low PT and it becomes unpolarized at large PT. And when we're considering really large PT, then uh, such as the region measured by the CMS detector, then the polarization becomes really close to unpolarized. And this has a good agreement with the data as well. So um, we're trying to go to the next order in, in this calculation. So to do that, um, we're, trying to, uh, we're trying to consider all of the diagrams that would give a CC bar and a, that, that would give a CC bar with non-zero PT. And, and there are 16 diagrams of them. And the CC bar uh, produced partonically will become the proto-tramonium before the hadronization. And the ma mass of the CC bar would then fix the relative momentum of the heavy quark, which is a K. So we form, uh, we parameterize um, the, so we swap, um, momentum of the C and the, and the momentum of the C bar for the momentum of the J psi and the relative momentum of the heavy quark. So these pol polarized cross, cross section uh, are then computed using the appropriate uh, polarization factor for the charmonium and all the final state momenta are integrated while restricting um, this uh, P psi dot K equals to zero. And the PDFs that we use in this calculation is the CT14 um, it's a newer set than the CTEC-6. And uh, in order to describe the, uh, the distribution at low PT, uh, some KT smearing is applied to the initial state parton. So this is a formula that we use uh, at the next order. Uh, so we're using a, an improved color evaporation model where the mass of the J psi is being uh, restrained from the real mass, uh, the, the, the PDG mass of the quirconium to the hadronic threshold. So this, uh, when, we, when we go back to the collinearly factorized approach, this should not have a strong dependence on the factorizations, uh, on, on the factorization scale. So we use a different sets of variation um, in, in constructing the error bands. Uh, and, um, but these are the same set of variation used in other color evaporation uh, model approach. So these are the preliminary uh, results that we have for this calculation. Um, again, we uh, we we give it uh, a small uh, KT kick for the initial state parton at the order of about one GeV squared to the initial state. So, uh, but this is what's not needed in the KT factorization approach as the unintegrated PDFs are already KT dependent. So um, on the left shown is the PD distribution at 7 TeV when compared to the LHCB data and the same calculation, but for the polarization parameter and compared to the uh, LHCB data. So these are pre preliminary results uh, with uncertainty bands constructed by varying the charm quark mass only. Um, uh, we have tried to uh, vary the factorization and renormalization scale. They do not, uh, they do not give a huge dependence on the scale, uh, but it's not shown right now. Um, and we have some agreement with the polarization data. Um, if we just look at um, the result by charm quark mass variation. So there are also other polarization parameters and we're also trying to calculate them to give a more complete picture of what the polarization is. So um, what lambda phi and lambda tilde um, uh, is, are, um, is that they can give you a frame invariant uh, lap polarization parameter. So if you calculate the lambda theta, which is the, uh, the plot that we have, I've shown before, 
and also the lambda phi using this uh, formula, then you can have uh, a combination of lambda theta and lambda phi to give you a lambda, which is frame invariant. So this is one of the ways, uh, one of the ways to, to come up with a frame invariant polarization parameter, which is known as lambda tilde. So how, to, um, how is that invariant? So if we take a look at an example, which is a completely transverse lambda theta equals to plus one in this chosen z axis. So this lambda phi describes the azimuth of anisotropy. So if we have a completely transverse with no anti, uh, with, with lambda phi equals to, com to zero, then if we rotate this the same distribution, um, we would have a different lambda theta. Um, but the, la the, the lambda phi would also co-vary with, uh, with this rotation. So, um, but if you use this formula to calculate uh, lambda tilde, they will still give you the same lambda, lambda tilde to be plus one. And a similar story, if, you, if we choose this axis, the same axis, and we have a completely longitudinal production to start with, with lambda phi equals to zero. And even if we rotate the distribution to be, to have lambda theta equals to plus one, which is the other extreme, um, but the fact that lambda phi co-vary in this rotation uh, would allow lambda tilde to be uh, the same as before. So calculating lambda tilde would, uh, in principle, remove all frame-induced kinematics dependencies, and it would give you the more uh, uh, direct comp comparison of theory to data. So what we did is uh, we, we computed lambda, lambda phi, and using lambda theta and lambda phi that we calculated, uh, we, com we uh, calculated the lambda tilde. So what we have found is that the invariant polarization parameter uh, it's close to zero, and at large PD is slightly negative. But has it? But this um, this would give you give us a um, a better comparison to data. Better in better in a way that we uh, such that no frames are good. Um, so like color um, the Collins upper frame um, would have. Uh, would have a, a set of lambda, uh, would have a band in, lambda, lambda phi would have a band in Collins upper frame and a different band in, in, in the helicity frame. Um, but when we're calculating a lambda tilde, then um, it is just one lambda doesn't depend on the frame. So this is um, the last slide. Um, in this talk, I try to review different models uh, developed to describe the quirconium yield at high energy, in, in high energy collisions. And I also reviewed recent attempts to solve the polarization puzzle in the color evaporation model family. So I'm suggesting that the color evaporation model, uh, any improved color evaporation model, is worth exploring in terms of polarized production. So, uh, but there are also other questions to be answered in the future that um, NRQCD is rigorous, uh, but still can describe the A to C production and a JPSI polarization simultaneously using the same LDMEs and also respecting heavy quark spin symmetry. On the other hand, color evaporation model is less rigorous. It can describe the yield and perhaps the polarization in hydro production, but we haven't, uh, been ex uh, we haven't applied it to other collision systems. Um, and how about A to C for an uh, improved color evaporation model? Um, that we still haven't calculated that yet. Um, but beyond that, uh, we still want to learn more about uh, quarkonium production. How do the CC bar pairs uh, eventually end up in J psi? Um, can we describe the mechanism beyond just FQs in the color evaporation model and the LDMEs? So um, there are a lot more to be learned in the future. So um, that's it for my, um, for my presentation. Okay, yeah, thank you very much, Vincent. Let's try to give Vincent some virtual applause in the participants window, and I'll try to give him some real <laughs> applause here. <laughs> Excellent, thank Vincent. You. Yeah, thanks for this really systematic overview. It was quite a nice talk. So um, are there any questions? Yeah, again, if you have a question uh, to unmute your mic, we need to know that you wanna speak. So type speak in the chat window. And 
while we're waiting for that, Tim, if you don't mind, I have a question. Is that okay? Please, oh no, of course. Steve. Okay. Yeah, so, so Vincent, can we go back to this, this lambda tilde that you were describing here? Um, um, one of my original questions was, of course, to understand what would be required to remove this frame dependence that you were seeing. What do experiments need to do in order to put data points on this plot you show on slide 54? So there are, there are experiments that, put, uh, that, put, say, that also do uh, lambda tilde measurement, but the most straightforward way is to just convert their um, measured lambda theta and lambda phi in, in this way. And this is not the only way to construct a frame invariant parameter, but this is one of the most commonly used now uh, in variant form to give a lambda tilde because it still runs from negative one to one, um, which is very um, similar to lambda theta. Okay, all right, so it is a relatively simple transform for the experiments to do. This doesn't require a lot of retooling for experiments when they quote their results. Yeah, but they, they are, um, if you directly transform, take just uh, in, in one frame, for example, the experiment measured in the Collins opera frame, the lambda theta and lambda phi, uh, if you just do this conversion and versus the same conversion in the helicity frame, uh, some systematic uncertainty will make them, doesn't, will make them look like not invariant. Okay. Yeah. All right, Pavel, you have a question. Yes, hi Vincent, this is uh, Pavel Nadolsky. Well, um, uh, thank you so much, first of all, for this very interesting um, review of the uh, measurements. Um, you have shown a, a variety of measurements at different levels of accuracy. And I also was very happy to see that you use some of the results from our uh, well, CTEC collaboration of, with like bipartisan distribution functions. Uh, what's not clear to me is that what, what are your um, ob objectives in terms of um, let, let's say uh, validating various models. So, so it seems that the accuracy of these predictions varies, varies quite a bit. Like for example, if you were to uh, say, uh, what, what is your next big target? So that would really pin down certain things and uh, well, uh, it would, re would really clarify some of the comparisons that we have made. Uh, as well as maybe you need something from us like new PDFs or some, some, some predictions. I noticed, for example, that you use leading order PDFs, but they, those are not very precise. And uh, then again, so maybe that, that's sufficient for you in your case. So oh, sorry, object did there, there are a few questions here. Yeah, the, the ob objective is to have a polarized calculation in the color evaporation model to mm -hmm. make it as competitive um, or trying to be competitive with NRQCD because um, mm -hmm. NRQCD is not going to um, describe uh, polarization, JPSI uh, cross-section and A to C cross-section all at mm -hmm. the same time using the same mixing. So our objective is to provide a color evaporation model version of the calculation. Um, and we're, we're just starting right now. And it's, and it's we're, we're just starting with hydro production. Mm -hmm. um, did I answer your question or am I missing? Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so then, uh, but then again, lo looking forward, uh, okay, so the, is working with this leading order predictions is still, is still acceptable for, for the next two years or uh, what would be your, again, so uh, what, 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 I guess what is the uh, vision towards the future in this case? So we're trying to um, calculate the S date to start with and mm -hmm. um, we, we will try to calculate the p-state contribution as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much where we're heading to. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, I think uh, Richard had a question, so I've unmuted you, Richard. Yeah, I have a rather uh, experimental question. Uh, all the data that you compared to essentially are coming from experiments with unpolarized beams. If you would have a beam or target that is polarized, how different would, would that picture be? Yeah, th that, that is a good question. So I've been asked uh, multiple times that to give, what if your uh, initial state is polarized, uh, how would that change? Um, it, 
in, in this calculation, if we assume the initial state is unpolarized uh, in, in a fashion that we sum over all the polarization uh, for the initial state gluon. And um, if the initial state is polarized, then it would have a, an influence of the, uh, of the final state as well. So I can't say for sure, but um, there's a big difference in terms of setting up the calculation. Thank you. Okay, it doesn't look like we have any more questions and we're about 10 minutes over our time. Does anybody have one last urgent question that they would like to ask? And Tim, I'll trust you to unmute them if they need it. Okay, it sounds like not. So let's, let's thank Vincent one more time. So thank you very much for, for providing this excellent seminar for us. Yeah, thanks and for the chance as well. Yeah, no, and I hope you stay safe and stay well out in California. I know it's, it's rough out there right now. And uh, to everybody else as well, I hope you stay well and stay safe as well. Have, have a good evening, everybody. Thanks again, Vincent. Take care. Right. You too. Thanks, everyone.